we at Policy Exchange like living dangerously, so we like doing things. Lenin used to denounce the sin of spontaneism amongst uh, the working class. We like doing things uh, spontaneously here, and uh, we've got an all-star panel for you. We'd delight to be able to welcome Secretary of State. Glad also to be able to welcome uh, Brigadier John Deverell, much experience of the work between the military and DFID as the respondent and our new chair of trustees, Alexander Downer, obviously previously High Commissioner of Australia and uh, Foreign Minister of Australia, which also comprises in their system uh, the DFID role who will be uh, delivering uh, the vote of thanks. It follows on from an extensive work program uh, that we have here at Policy Exchange. Uh, most recently, the paper we produced, which uh, is available about their Global Britain, Global Challenges, How to Make Aid More Effective by Jonathan DuPont, with a forward by Ruth Davidson. So we've been at the heart of this debate of how to uh, reconfigure aid in these times, in these changing times, and in these times, obviously, of uh, budgetary and political pressure. So Secretary of State, welcome for the first time to our platform. Look forward to hearing what you have to say, and then we'll open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here with uh, Tobias Elwood, who's uh, at the back there, our Veterans Minister. And can I just say from the start um, that there are no jokes in my speech about any of my colleagues. So uh, as half the press leave. Um, but I'm delighted to uh, be here in Armed Forces Week. And earlier this year, I reset the focus and our work at UK Aid. I made a speech about our national values and our connection with humanity, and why that for us is something more than just a pragmatic choice for our nation. Being unselfish and caring for others is at the core of our national values. It's embedded in our politics and in our democracy. It's at the heart of how we organize our public services, and it's the core principle behind how we pay for them. The British people like to help each other. It's in our communities, it's how we work with our neighbours and our belief in good causes. And it's our ultimate expression of that willingness to help, to serve in our armed forces. And I say this as a Secretary of State who is both a current member of our armed forces and also a former aid worker. In that speech, I spoke about Operations Manor and Chowhound, run by the RAF in the closing stages of the Second World War. They were humanitarian aid drops of food to save the lives of thousands of people in the still unliberated Netherlands. They were operations done at great risk, with little benefit to the war effort, and they took from our own. Our own rationing was cut in Britain just 19 days after those airdrops ceased. So why did we do it? Because that is what great nations do. And I know that the connection between UK aid and our armed forces is deep and strong. The instinct to protect and defend walks hand in hand with our politics. Defense, diplomacy, and development are interreliant on each other. Often we need our armed forces to create the security and the means to reach those that we are trying to help. Our armed forces are the global role model in this regard. And defense depends on diplomacy and development to reduce the crises that it is dealing with. As General Mathis said, as he argued to maintain funding to the State Department, if you want to cut their budget, you better buy me some more bombs. We're both operationally focused departments, expert at getting the job done, often in incredibly difficult circumstances. We're both members of the National Security Council. Our purpose is aligned. And we've huge operational experience of working together. Typhoon Haiyan, Ebola, Mount Sinjar, the Caribbean hurricanes, and the Nepal earthquake. And of course, we work in conflict zones, most notably in operations in Afghanistan. We work in the same places, with DFID committed to spending 50% of our overseas development assistance in fragile and conflict-affected states. 
The UK has two of the largest mine action charities, Halo and Mines uh, Advisory Group who are already making use of ex-service personnel with explosive ordnance disposal expertise. And sometimes our people aren't just similar, they are the same people. There is a huge crossover between those that work in international development and those who are armed forces reservists. Many I meet out in the field carrying out projects in the wake of disasters are armed forces veterans on their second career. Part of the 0.7 gross national income aid budget has always been spent by defence and in support of defence. But there is now a new approach that we are taking that involves much more explicit co-designed and co-funded projects. And these will help deliver excellence in aid, but also will work more explicitly in Britain's national interest. A good example of that approach is the new projects that we're taking forward with the MOD. We're doing this with every department, but defence was a particular priority. The first non-humanitarian trip I did as Secretary of State at the turn of the year was to the United States to look at civilian military cooperation, which the Americans do extremely well with. I worked with their armed forces, with my US counterparts and others, to develop our thinking on this. Mark Green and I spoke at RUSI earlier uh, in spring on this issue. And later, together, we launched the Hope in Conflict Fund. This is a tech challenge uh, to organizations around the world to provide us with new capabilities and solutions to protect people in conflict situations. I want DFID and the MOD to develop those capabilities together, whether it's civil contingencies at home or humanitarian crises overseas. We can support and inform each other to better meet the challenges that we both face. We've sought to generate our own capabilities, which again will give Her Majesty's Government more options in crises. For example, we're tapping into the best minds in tech, defence, civil contingencies and elsewhere to better protect civilians. And this was the idea behind the humanitarian innovation hub I announced earlier this year. I was fed up with going to the House of Commons and having to explain to them why technically we couldn't airdrop food and aid uh, or get the power back up or create uh, drinking water for people under siege in conflict zones. So we're developing those new capab capabilities. And at the core of these changes is my intention to make best use of both our budgets. If I can deliver a humanitarian operation, and it's cost effective and appropriate, for me to seek the use of UK military assets to do so, then I will. The fact that my actions benefit another department is a reason for doing it, not a reason for not doing it. And that's why we must demonstrate in everything we do with UK aid that it's not just we're spending money well, but that we couldn't spend the money better in the national interest. That is the new higher spending bar that my department has to meet. So if there is spare capability in defence that development can use, then we should do so, and we should foot the bill for it. That's right, to sweat those assets which have been paid for by UK taxpayers. This is not about the militarisation of aid, but about ensuring that each department plays a complementary role. Government must be more than the sum of its parts. And Global Britain remains committed to upholding and promoting international humanitarian law and its principles. Remember, this country was the driving force behind the Geneva Conventions of 1949, and we were the driving force between the anti-personnel landmine ban and the Cluster Munitions Convention. We take the preservation of international humanitarian law seriously. Why? Because we have long memories and it's proved very expensive in the past for us to restore those norms once they've been lost. 
A disregard for those principles is directly responsible for the increasing civilian death rate and suffering in conflict. Increasingly, parties to conflict are putting obstacles to civilians receiving even the most basic relief and protection. This is one of the main challenges faced by my department on a daily basis. And we simply must make every effort to ensure that where that law is broken, those responsible are held to account. So, what else will you see different in the future about how we work with defence? We're talking about how we can work better together, share ideas and learn lessons. And we'll further improve our joint preparedness for extreme weather events, in particular the hurricane season. And we'll build the disaster response capability of all developing country partners. We're also building stronger ties in our respective worlds. DFID briefs defence attaches before they go out into country. And DFID colleagues take key MOD leadership courses and the MOD brief us regularly. In the future, we're looking at working on several new projects tackling gender-based violence. And this might include the provision and the improvement of quality of peacekeeping troops, as well as joint training programs and building stability in preventing conflict in developing countries. The future does look exciting, and there's much more we can do to ensure that we're more than the sum of our parts. But there are further things we can do too, to support those who chose to do their duty for our nation. Across the Commonwealth, many answered the call to serve alongside Her Majesty's Armed Forces before their countries became independent. And approximately 8,500 of these elderly veterans or their widows face a daily struggle to meet the basic needs of decent food, shelter and medicines. No one could possibly think that is right. Those who have served alongside our nation deserve our support in their twilight years. So I'm very pleased to announce that DFID is designing a bespoke program for pre-independence Commonwealth veterans who served under the Commonwealth banner as UK allies prior to their countries becoming independent and are now living below the poverty line. We're working with veterans charities to ensure that those who have given so much are looked after for the rest of their lives. We expect the programme to commence next year at the point when LIBOR funding for those individuals ceases. It's a win for the developing world and it's a win for the UK on an issue the public care passionately about, the welfare of our veterans. And it's a further example of how UK aid is changing. A national mission in the national interests, Global Britain delivering the global goals. Thank you. John. So to say, thank you very much, and thanks to Dean very much. Um, so, of course, uh, I also work with banks. I've been I've been out of government service now for ten years, but like a lot of people, I find it difficult to escape my past. So. I used to be Director of Defence Diplomacy in the Ministry of Defence. I got a close interest in this. Also spent half my working life in some of these difficult places. And since then I've worked in, in, uh, through Stabilisation Unit, which is a, a tri-government uh, tri department uh, funded organisation to go out at short notice to these places. And have worked separately on um, stabilisation and security projects to that. Uh, also working with banks, of course, if, if everybody got accountability right, uh, which is a word that Secretary of State mentioned, then the LIBOR rigging wouldn't have happened in the first place, which would have mean, would meant, unfortunately, the money wouldn't have been available. Um, if we get this right, then, of course, uh, soft power becomes uh, smart power, which uh, is an extra reason for getting it right. Um, having worked at the sharp end, militarily, in various uh, conflicts when I was serving, um, I'm one of those who believes that, that military force can never solve anything apart from in the shortest term. Uh, and even then it's, it's used best as a context in which to find political solutions. I think the worst thing of all, which is why the, many of these countries we think about in terms of uh, really conflict-afflicted countries, 
uh, suffer so much is, is when conflict is, is in the hands of incompetent forces. And I'll return to that uh, in a moment. So I just want to make some points through stories. Uh, my own experience is very briefly mindful of time uh, because I think they resonate uh, more than just um, the general points I might make. Um, I spent quite a lot of last year working in Somalia. I was going every month to Mogadishu and spent quite a lot of each month in Mogadishu. Uh, there are hundreds, hundreds of, of internationals working in Somalia. The vast majority of them, and uh, many of these are um, Brits uh, who work with the UN, people working with AMISOM, African Union, etc., uh, work behind the wire in Mogadishu. I was one of the very few who's actually embedded with the Somali leadership. And the reason why people like, the few people like me were doing those things is because uh, now there's even more requirement to outsource these things because I'm quite sure that 20 years ago the sorts of things I was doing would have been done in-house by British government servants. Uh, but of course now increasingly they've, they've been done by outsiders. That's not necessarily a bad thing because consultants, as we're called, um, often have wider experience. And whilst one life is worth as much as the next life, uh, they're slightly less in the way of headlines when something goes uh, wrong and they lose their lives. So again, I was working in Lebanon up on the border with Syria for about a year and a half when that conflict uh, started off. And again, we had much more freedom of movement to work up on the border uh, with the Lebanese to try and render the border slightly less uh, permeable, which was as much political as practical. Uh, and not being British government servants, we were not restricted just to North Beirut and had much more freedom of movement. So I think again, uh, echoing in a way what the Secretary of State has, has, has been saying, this is a full court press and one needs to use all the resources, uh, not even just the military. Um, going back to Somalia, the importance of having people embedded at a senior level uh, in these ministries is invaluable. Working uh, as eminence grise, personalities are really important, patience is very important. Uh, in order to, um, uh, to advise behind the scenes, it's got to be their show. There's a lot we can do if we're prepared to take uh, the risk. Risk, I think, is very important. If one looks at the American forces in Afghanistan, they have a, a policy which is um, advise, assist, accompany. Uh, in my experience, all too often, British forces, sometimes to their frustration, are not allowed to accompany. So we, we train up and do the things as part of this uh, corporate comprehensive whole, but then British forces, the people doing the training and mentoring, have then to wave them goodbye at the camp gates. And actually, sometimes one needs to take the risk in order to be effective, because there has to be continuity. I'm a great believer in alternative livelihoods. So very often the rubric uh, coming out of Her Majesty's ambassadors when they talk in broad terms about what they're doing, uh, three things, uh, security, stability, and prosperity. Um, and uh, I'm a strong advocate of the prosperity piece, um, putting in place plans to build the foundation and, and the funding to build the foundations for prosperity in order to create alternative livelihoods. I'm often told, no, John, it's important, it's not urgent. I say it is urgent because in my experience it often takes two years to build the foundations. One can achieve a fragile peace in some of these places, uh, but unless the fragile peace brings tangible benefit to the people holding the guns, uh, then of course they can break the peace in an instant. Somalia, again, is an interesting case in point. The longest coastline in Africa, 1,300 miles, um, and of course it's not all at war. There are places where it's possible to go outside the, the wire and work with local people fishing. Perhaps the only beneficiary uh, of the war, the fighting in Somalia the last few years have been the fish because they're no longer overfished. Um, because of my Turkish colleagues there, it came to my attention that the Turks were bidding for um, 19 years of fishing rights. Uh, so I said to the British ambassador there, who's an excellent man, not least because he had commercial experience before he went into the foreign office, um, please advise the Somalis at top level uh, not take up this, uh, this offer from the Turks unless it's accompanied with a condition that a significant percentage of the fish are processed in Somalia. Otherwise, the money will benefit a few and just the government. And if one thinks of fishing as a good example, um, the reason why people, why there's less piracy now is not because of alternative livelihoods, but because the international shipping, the cargo ships, the oil ships, are now by and large better protected. Uh, but actually, if one were able to go in and work with them in order to help develop what used to be there, for instance, the, uh, the onshore processing plants, uh, the distribution hubs, the transport, the refrigeration. Not only could you provide alternative livelihoods, but also supply some of the protein needs to a country which is periodically afflicted by, uh, by, um, by famine. And on that note, I think it's interesting to compare and contrast what success looks like 
I speak now as a former military man, so when I was in the military, I had a very clear idea about what success looked like. We have to accept that success from a, from a government point of view is not necessarily the same thing. To go in and help alleviate some famine uh, is, looks good, it is good, it's very important. But actually, if one looks at, at, at the sustainability of these policies, which has to be something we aim at, these are not just one-offs. If we don't get them right, then we'll be bedeviled by the same problems next time round. Actually, is the dependence on the semi-nomadic people on their flocks. Of course, the first thing is to die the animals. It's all very well going in to give food to the people, but if one hasn't gone in early enough to help them look after their livestock and, and, and provide water for livestock, then, of course, the people will become even more... Uh, in need of support and will probably move to the towns, a whole world of pain because, of course, there's nothing there to provide for livelihoods at all. I think Al-Shabaab is an interesting case in point because, in my experience working in West Belfast, again, um, uh, in, when, I w when I was, my last job in, in the British government uh, 10 years ago was a year and a half in the West Bank, looking at Hamas in the West Bank. Uh, Al-Shabaab what we tend to look at, not least politically in this country, is the terrorist threat because it's tangible. Actually, what's really important to look at in these organizations is the work they do behind the scenes, what's below the surface of the rest of the iceberg, because undoubtedly they, they uh, sometimes for genuinely altruistic reasons, as in West Belfast, I was, as was Hamas in the West Bank, are working to support the people. They're running clinics, hospitals, schools, and mosques, which, of course, is how they insidiously get their... Um, their, their own ethos into the people, which can be very damaging. So I always say to my colleagues in, in the Somali government as well, it's not just about doing the tangible stuff, it's taking a long view and actually putting in place, um, displacing the bad guys who, for instance, uh, in terms of dispute resolution, offer a very quick solution to things like land ownership. So how can we help them not using a rather slow British model but, to, but how, how we can help, in this case, the Somalis to do that sort of thing better. So really a truly comprehensive approach. Just very briefly, in, in, the, in the time remaining to me, I think from a military point of view, people need to deploy for longer. When I worked in the West Bank, my American boss, I was very useful to the Americans because I could live in the West Bank, they couldn't. Um, my American boss, uh, who was a senior general who worked direct to the US Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, he was posted there for five years unaccompanied. And I can think of Afghanistan where, um, in my experience, commanding officers of British units said to aid workers, uh, senior aid workers, what can we do to help? I'm sorry, you're just not here for long enough. Six months or a year does not cut it. We, the aid agencies, are sometimes in place for four years, five years, six years. And speaking to my good friend, a former chief of general staff, I said, you know, two or three years into the Iraq war, why are we sending senior officers and people, intelligence specialists, for six months or a year at most, the Americans send people often for longer. He said, yeah, you're right, John, we need to look at that. So I think one needs to stay the course, individual postings as well as taking a long view. Um, very briefly, Nigeria, working with uh, DFID there. DFID, quite rightly, were promoting human rights. Uh, talking with senior Nigerian officers, I said there's another way of presenting this. Human rights should be re is more palatable, for instance, to militaries in these places who are often part of the problem if they're presented as enabler. So one gets to support the community's right, and then they will work more closely with the armed forces in the country to alleviate poverty and, and to try and um, stop the bad guys do what they do, taking advantage. Um, and one shouldn't assume that uh, the forces in these places will naturally support the communities. And that's a whole extra level of mentoring and training which needs to be done in a very sensitive way so one's not preaching. Otherwise, again, the bad guys can present themselves as the protectors of the people against the armed forces in those countries. I come back to my first point, one has to mentor and get out of the camp gates and take risks. And I think my final point, which is a bit of a dig at the British government, and I have no embarrassment about doing so, is, is take a place like Yemen, which again I know extremely well from personal experience, as I know Saudi Arabia from before I left government service, and the fact that on the one hand we're arming Saudi Arabia uh, to, uh, whether we like it or not, in many cases to bomb innocent Yemeni uh, civilians, even when I was last involved in Yemen, which is a year ago, 4.5 million children not able to go to school. So reconstruction, to my mind, means the really serious long-term stuff. It's not just buildings. It's how you put back in place education, health, everything else, to avoid a longer-term problem of all sorts. Um, and, of course, the reasons why they can't go to school are self-evident for a number of cases. And yet, with the other hand, we're going in to help them from the point of view of, of aid agencies, humanitarian support. There has to be a paradox there which needs to be addressed Otherwise, um, what are we doing in the first place? Uh, which, to my mind, comes back to the central point. 
when and if we do this, we've got to be serious, we've got to take a long-term view, and we've got to be truly joined up right across the piece. Thank you so much. Just trying to get a sense of the audience, how many questions we've got, who wants to ask. No question too outrageous, you just have to state your name and organisation. Gentleman there in the third row, white shirt. Name and Brazier, you better wait till you get the mic. Oh, thank you. My wife says I did. Mm. Can we hear? Um, my wife, it, it doesn't seem to be working. It is working. Can everyone hear? Can, can you hear me? Oh, that's Name right. and organisation, sorry. Julian Brazier, uh, former Member of Parliament. Um, I, I seem to me that Penny made an absolutely compelling case for this being not just right, but also in our national interest. And I was just thinking of the contrast between the situation in Lebanon now, and a frail country with one refugee for every two inhabitants, where actually Brigadier John played quite a prominent role in setting up um, military assistance side by side with a very large um, DFID program, which I was privileged to visit. Um, the contrast, say, with what happened in Afghanistan in the 1980s, a country which had played a large role in bringing down the government of the Soviet Union and was left completely devastated, four million refugees in Pakistan, and the West just walked away. And, of course, the consequences of that in terms of the formation of first the Taliban, then becoming a, uh, a bolt hole for al-Qaeda, and eventually 9-11 were remarkable. So it seems to me it's a really, really strong... Uh, uh, case. I just have one uh, question. Um, Penny, you've made quite a lot of progress in terms of within the law and the international conventions, in terms of being able to reach further into the security with odorable funds, doubling, for example, I think the amount of um, peacekeeping, which now counts as odorable. Do you see scope for going further in that direction? Thank you. Um, well, First of all, I'd say, um, absolutely, we need to recognize um, that we have to support nations like Lebanon and Jordan in the huge burden that they are um, undertaking by supporting refugees, to trying to stop um, a, a, a terrible situation escalating. And uh, this autumn, the World Bank will be publishing uh, a human capital index. So this will be a league table looking at what nations can afford to spend on their own um, citizens in health and education, which we are going to use to decide uh, who we fund and, and who we do not. So if you want to permanently outsource your health and education to donor nations like Britain, um, <coughs> look elsewhere because we won't do that. But what it will also do is look at what those nations are doing for other nations' citizens. And, uh, and give them more favorable terms uh, in terms of um, the World Bank. Um, and I think other donors will start to follow suit, and that, I think, is a, is a big step forward. Um, myself and Bill Gates are Jim Kim's first human capital champions, and we're going to be pushing that. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, the OECD rules, and indeed Treasury rules as well, it's not just OECD rules, but rules that we operate in Whitehall, um, they're there for a reason, we choose to abide by them for a reason, and we choose to be part of the 0.7 club um, because it actually helps what other people do with their money, um, and we want them to spend it on the sorts of things that are included in 0.7. But we should always have a sense check about that and what we need to do as a nation. Um, so we always need to justify to the British public uh, and why we have chosen to operate within those rules as opposed to deviate from them. Um, and that's why we push for further reforms uh, of, of the DAC rules. Things that we're doing at the moment, we're still pushing more on peacekeeping. We've got some wins from that, but we could do so much more, and so much more is needed. We're also uh, pushing and winning the argument on being able to uh, use our um, precious odour in countries that have lifted themselves out of poverty, but for some reason have then fallen back in. And uh, that reverse graduation, I think we're winning that argument. We're now looking at the detail of, of that. There will be other things, though, uh, that we are, are still far from getting over the line. And for me, one of those things is being able to use our aid budget on legitimate humanitarian missions in 
places like the Caribbean, uh, which are not ODA eligible countries. Um, I have always said that as Secretary of State, I will not do something that I think is the wrong thing for our nation to be doing. Um, at the moment, we choose to be operating within those rules because it is in our national interest to do so. But we should never justify our actions by those rules. That's the approach I'm taking. But as well as all of that, the co-designed, co-funded approach that we're taking, that everything we do with ODA across Whitehalls is not just DFID. We have a cross-ministerial group for every ODA spending department. We need better coherence. Uh, and everything we do needs to be better quality aid, but it also needs to demonstrate why that is the best use of our money in the national interest. We borrow this money to do these things, and we can't go back to the British taxpayer and ask them for more money unless we are absolutely sure that that money we already have could not be spent better. Thank you. I see quite a lot of hands up. Gentlemen, the second row in the front there in the middle in the check shirt. Yeah. <coughs> thank you, Dean. Penny, thank you very much indeed. A uh, name and organisation. Uh, General Tim Cross, retired a few years ago and, um, and doing various things. Um, I, I want to endorse what you've said, but uh, I'll take you back to where you started, which was the work to uh, deliver aid to the Netherlands. Because we're just uh, in the middle of remembering the Berlin airlift, uh, which happened uh, about 70 years ago now, I think. That time in the Berlin airlift, we in the UK had a separate air ministry, war office and admiralty. It took us about 20 years to form a thing called the Ministry of Defence and another 20 or 30 years to form a permanent joint headquarters which became effectively the operations room of the MOD. Take what you've said and think ahead. I, for some time, having worked with DFID, the FCO, a lot over the years in various places, um, all that you want to do comes back to structure, resourcing and, and, and priorities and so on. When are we going to form a single ministry looking at external affairs, which leaves foreign policy to aid to defence properly. It doesn't mean to say we do away with specialisations within them. We still have an Air, uh, Navy and Land Command headquarters. But here in Westminster, we have a single Department of State driving sensible, strategic, joined-up policy. And the comprehensive approach and the stabilisation unit were attempts at that, but they weren't I mean, they were successful in some respects, but not, in, not to the extent that I'm, I'm talking about. Well, I'm not going to get into, uh, because I've been in severe trouble, um, what, what the MOD uh, should be up to. But I would say that um, the NSC uh, is evolving, and it's evolving uh, very quickly. Um, I think in its infancy, it wasn't particularly strategic, and the fusion doctrine that runs through it uh, was not necessarily really uh, brought to life. That is changing uh, now, and uh, I think it is a, I mean, we are, my US counterpart is very jealous that I have a seat around that table and that development is at the heart of that fusion doctrine. Um, so that is actually what should drive that coherence. Um, but it is then uh, the practical things that stem uh, from that across Whitehall. And this is why um, machinery of government matters. Um, so the new group that I have set up, which is every ODA spending department, but it is also uh, the NSC uh, with those cross-government funds. Um, all the expertise to do this well sits within my department. So we're training other departments. Um, we're providing that coherence and we're giving them the tools that they actually need to make gu good judgments about what they do. Um, ultimately, that level of granularity and that understanding amongst civil servants but also ministers about where, what and why and what it is that we're trying to achieve and what's the sequencing of that because as the, as the Brigadier said, one of the other things we're changing in UK aid is this much more sustainable approach. So instead of doing lots of different programs separately, we are looking, say in healthcare, for those different programs to build healthcare systems. Um, how can we do that? and ensure that the security that we want to do it in uh, is developing at uh, the, the right pace. Having those plans for nations, having catalyst nations, having a much better understanding of, of what we should be doing and when. So that is coming. Um, whether we need, you know, we're, we're, we'll be in the same building or separate buildings, that stuff doesn't really matter. Well, it matters what, hugely, okay. what, Well, what matters, matters I think, hugely. what matters is have you got the right people working together. Those structures we've set up 
But the NSC is evolving, and it's evolving very quickly, and it's getting better at doing these things. I know that uh, gentleman there in the third row, the aisle. Hi, my name is George Turkington. I'm the if you can speak up, sorry. My name is George Turkington. I'm the director in DFID for Western Southern Africa. Um, I just wanted to give a personal account of something that I worked on that basically underpins the compelling narrative that the Secretary of State has set out today. Um, and basically, I was the director of DFID responsible um, for the DFID response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Um, thinking back to 2014-15, this Ebola outbreak quickly became an international emergency. I mean, 28,000 people had the virus, um, around about 11,000 deaths. So it became a huge international crisis. Um, and I'm really proud of what the UK did in responding to that crisis because it really was the best of British. Our armed forces, our wonderful NHS, um, great volunteers from DFID and from the Foreign Office, combined with many other departments' work, really forged a brilliant UK response to that emergency. Um, and when I think back on that, I think there's three things that occurred to me um, with particular relation to the uh, working with the military. I mean, the one was just creating presence in Sierra Leone. The government was overwhelmed. We had to quickly rebuild confidence with the government and the international system. And that fantastic UK effort coming together on the ground really did achieve that. And it was really important in encouraging other countries to participate in the response. It's great to see the former High Commissioner of Australia here. We signed an MOU together, um, and I just want to recognise your country's intervention. And you intervention. evacuated our nurse. No, I, and absolutely, and that's just a sign of um, how well this thing works. So, I mean, creating that presence and that confidence was really important. Of course, having logistics was really important. So, the deployment of the Royal um, Fleet Auxiliary Ship Argos with its three million helicopters basically gave us logistics to get around the country quickly with people and expertise to the worst affected districts. So that was incredibly important. And the last thing is just command and control. You know, helping the government rebuild its national Ebola crisis management center, um, making sure that that worked for the international community, for the government at national level and local levels. And it's one of the proudest things that um, I have ever witnessed, just seeing young British lieutenants and captains basically building those management systems at local levels and just to pick up on a point that John made speaking to paramount chiefs and local elders to make sure that they understood why we were there why we needed their support to get on top of this e epidemic I mean I think looking forward um, the issues that the Secretary of State has talked about today it will help institutionalize that approach I think it's really important when you're strapped into a personal protection suit treating Ebola you don't want to be trying to find out what an MOD acronym is or a DFID acronym or an NHS one. So breaking down those institutional barriers, I think, is really important. Um, doing scenario planning together and doing risk mapping and sharing data. Um, so I mean, all of this is really important going forward. But I just want to conclude by saying when you see it all coming together in an international crisis like that, I mean, it's a really powerful thing. Thanks. John, do you have any thoughts? No, nothing to add. No, very good. Thank you. I see a lot of gentlemen there in the front row. Name and organisation. Um, James Landell, BBC. Uh, a, a couple of questions. Uh, the Secretary of State, uh, you were quoted recently as saying in, to Cabinet that the 0.7 target was no longer sustainable in its current form. Um, can you just sort of expand on that and explain what you meant? And secondly, as DFID works more with the MOD, how much more odour do you expect the MOD to spend? And are you still hoping to be able one day to spend core military costs and have that covered as ODA? Because that is one of the big hurdles you face at the moment. Is that still your target? So as I said in uh, my early answer to uh, Julian Brazier, um, we are, the 0.7 is critical to us. And as we, as we leave the EU and as we, uh, move out to the rest of the world, uh, we really do need to ensure that we have all the tools at our disposal to do that well and to lever the benefits that we hope will come from that newfound freedom. So that means our diplomacy uh, uh, and our, our networks overseas have to be very strong. In DFID, we're moving some of our funding um, from programming to headcount. So we will have a greater presence in the world. You'll see. Uh, differed actually in things like the financial centers of the world to combat illicit money flows and those sorts of things. So 
Diplomacy needs to be really strong. Development needs to be really strong. Um, the focus on 0.7, it's a, it's a great thing. It means a lot, as you will know, uh, to other nations that we do that. We are a development superpower, um, and that is incredibly important. But more importantly is uh, the effect we are having with it. What is it that we are trying to get done? Um, and how can we do that really well? Do the most good with the money that we have. And we need to focus equally uh, on that too. So I am looking at reforming DAC rules. I am looking at reforming some treasury rules, uh, how we actually operate in Whitehall. Um, and I am looking to really push the boundaries of how we work with other departments, co-funding, uh, co-designing that. Clearly, Defence is going through its modernisation programme. Uh, we will be very, very focused on that to look at where we can help. Um, I think it very unlikely that we would be, uh, I mean, we are reliant on particular capability. So the, in my speech, the, the, operation, uh, the operations that I mentioned, I think nearly all of them had involved helicopter lift. We're particularly uh, reliant on that, ca that capability and uh, other particular capabilities. But what I'm really interested in is that we are coming together and we are using both our budgets in the most sensible way. So the example I always give, which is not something we're about to do, but it's a good example. If there is spare capacity, um, if there are Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships that are uh, not on uh, active duty, they're sat off Plymouth, and I could take them up and do some mercy ship operations off Africa, I'm using that taxpayer-funded asset. Uh, I'm actually um, uh, getting, uh, getting that asset to work that the taxpayer has paid for. Uh, I'm helping my budget, and I'm uh, helping with the costs of another department. We can do so much more and have such greater effect just within the existing framework, but we are looking to reform that existing framework. Uh, and I, we're doing this with defence, but we are also doing it with all other departments. With health in particular, about a billion uh, will be uh, on healthcare, which is producing treatments that are being used on NHS wards. With the Department for Work and Pensions, we've developed our voluntary overseas uh, program for young people, which used to give them 12 weeks of great experience delivering an aid project. We're working with work coaches uh, in Job Centre Plus to turn that into an employment program to get disadvantaged UK youngsters into work and give them the confidence they need to do that. We're doing this with every department. It's a really exciting uh, new way of developing UK aid. And I think we need to do that because we need to ensure that we are reconnecting what we do, which is a national mission, to the public who pay for it. That's important because it's their money but it's also important because we want them to help. It's not just our aid budget or things that other departments can do. It's all the talent that's out there, all the amazing technical expertise that we can lever to help delivering the global goals. So it's a two-way street. DFID is helping other government departments and other government departments are helping DFID deliver the global goals. I think it's time limited and I'm gonna to have to disappoint some people's uh, final uh, race. I could, of, I could take we could take several. If, as you, as yes. a, a couple of pairs yes. of questions more. Two people on that far side there, gentleman and lady behind him. Name and organisation. Uh, <clears throat> Josh Arnold Forster, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm a member of the Labour, still a member of the Labour Party. Um, Penny, thank you very much for that, um, as ever, uh, stimulating. And can I take you back to the mach machinery of government point? And I, I do take the point that there is a willingness, and I, I think the fact that Tobias Elwood, who has written on this debate, is here, and I know that the MOD is very interested in your thoughts on this. And I'm not suggesting you have a, a super ministry or, or anything like that, but it, it's not just about the personalities. It's procedures and practices, both in the field, and I think Op Gritrock was a classic example of how to do it properly. Putting the military under the command of a different official, as far as I can see, was exemplary practice. But in Whitehall, we also need to think about it. And I'm thinking back to my experience in, in planning for the Helmand operation. We had a machinery of government. We had a cross-government working group. And every few weeks, we'd all turn up and we'd all um, discuss it. And the papers would be circulated beforehand. And, we'd, 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 and the officials would agree them. 
beforehand, but it was always a DFID paper or an MOD paper. It wasn't a co-designed paper. We weren't getting the policy experts to sit in the same room. They'd come together every once in a while, but they weren't doing it jointly. And that's, to come back to the point that Tim Cross was making, you do need them to be working more in a much more integrated fashion. And they do it on operations, to providing the right people are there. But in Whitehall, they don't necessarily do it. I think you need to sort of get into the get into those mechanics and just make sure you stamp, and working with Tobias, who I know is all over this as well, getting the different groups, I mean, within the MOD, they don't necessarily all work together in an effective way. And then when it comes to working with other government departments, it's a problem. So I just encourage you to keep, you know, keep pushing on the detail. Lady behind you. Hi, I'm Georgina Klein from the Varkey Foundation. So we work around the world to increase teacher status and capacity. And I was happy to hear education mentioned right at the end, thank you. But we think that education has an essential link between aid and development because of the um, ability it has to reduce extremism. And I was wondering why education hasn't really been mentioned today. And if you'll be working with the Department of Education as well to further develop education and your policies and also what priority in general you'll be giving to education. John, do you want to say something? Yeah, I two things, if I may say, to say first. Um, the first thing is I, I would like to add into your mix. Um, and of course, the reality is these people do, at various levels, get together around the table. I mean, there's no reason, to my mind, why executive papers shouldn't be provided, uh, and I'm sure they are sometimes. I would absolutely, going back to my point about the, the importance at an earlier stage of planning for alternative livelihoods, and, 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 and I can talk more about the, uh, the, the modalities of that which don't necessarily need to require any British taxpayers' money, but that's a separate subject, uh, is at these meetings there should also be uh, an economic, uh, there should be economic input. If it does fantastic stuff, but they're not people who work on commercial projects. One needs to have people, for instance, from the International Bank of Reconstruction Development, EBRD uh, as well, um, etc. cetera, um, uh, European Investment Bank, which is increasingly getting involved in these parts of the world, uh, also to be part of the mix, because with the best of them, well, people in government don't understand the, the, the commercial ways of kickstarting things, which are enabled by the banks. I think I'd also like to say something on education. I think in Somalia, um, of course, Al Shabaab, uh, as I mentioned, a huge insidious threat as well as a more obvious threat. So I forget his name, but about uh, two or three years ago, there was a newly appointed education minister in Mogadishu, who, at a very early stage of his tenure, I think literally about day one or two, said, "Right, we're going to." achieve commonality in the education programs across Somalia, and we're going to get jolly well sure it's good practical stuff, and we're going to veer well away from anything which can be uh, seen as um, that, uh, what Islam is all about, etc. On day one, that person had about five attempts on his life, literally, by al-Shabaab. So back to your point, this is really important. Uh, and I think one of the sadnesses about Syria and Yemen, God knows, it's, it's almost always the good people the professionals who find it most easy to leave because they have the contacts and most difficult to replace. So in terms of the comprehensive long-term strategy, a thousand times agreed. Thank you. Um, so just to Josh's point, I, I'll try and do this very quickly. Um, I, I have described this to people as taking how our teams in country work, which is completely seamless to Whitehall. That's, that's what good will look like in Whitehall. And DFID is well placed to be the catalyst for this because we work with every department. So just to give you a flavor of some of the things we're doing, from week one, I've had the mickey taken out of me for doing this, but I have taken my senior team, my ministerial team, to foreign office prayers. So we have our DFID prayers, but I go to foreign office prayers because from the top, we want to be working absolutely together with uh, the Foreign Office and the strategic direction that they are setting. We have um, 70 of our people sat in trade. We have FCO uh, staff sat in DFID. So we are moving around and we have just actually set up uh, a DFID hub in the Cabinet Office. So we are actually moving our people uh, across Whitehall to build capacity in, in other government departments. And certainly, again, from the NSC and the work that flows from there, um, people will hold the pen. So my one of my staff, for example, holds the pen on the Africa strategy, working with everyone across government. So as I say, the NSC uh, is uh, evolving. 
but we're also doing this in a, in a much more methodical way, and it doesn't stop at Whitehall. So one of the five priorities that I announced in my Welcome Trust speech earlier this year when I reset UK aid was an initiative called The Great Partnership. And this is not just about what we do in Whitehall, this is about town hall, our education institutions. It's about uh, uh, our entrepreneurs, our, our business networks. And we are harnessing what we do to those networks. We're setting up new networks of entrepreneurs working in development and tech uh, uh, folk working in development, working much more strategically with the private sector and big business. Because actually we are not going to deliver the global goals unless we get those people involved. So this is very methodical. Um, this is part of a work plan that we are, we are going through, is to, to, to build those connections and enable people to join in. Um, my favorite anecdote, um, one of the most brilliant bits of kit, which is saving uh, enormous numbers of uh, mums-to-be and their, their babies, um, which uh, helps um, uh, when a baby is stuck in the birth canal and you don't have a hospital on hand. That piece of kit, was designed by an Argentinian car mechanic who heard our call out to say, we've got a problem we want, we're looking for someone to solve, and thought, I've got something in the back that would fix that. And he, he developed this amazing piece of kit, which is saving thousands of lives. We should be doing that everywhere and levering everyone into help. But we are getting our act together in Whitehall. And if it looks like it does, as it, it does in country, then, then we'll have done our job. Um, with regard to education, we're very defence focused today. Education is absolutely at the heart of everything we do. We do a huge amount of work with education through connecting classrooms, but we are looking at new initiatives, which again benefit uh, the UK as well as the developing world. We're 60 million teachers short in the world. Uh, tech is going to be absolutely critical for us reaching every child. Uh, that we want to have an education and we could do a bit more of that in the UK as well particularly through language teaching so there's a great synergy between what we need in the UK and some things we want to develop for the developing world as well good final paragraph gentlemen there have been waiting patiently gentlemen behind you uh, Tom Bennion a former member of Parliament and I run a charity called Zane in which we have some 600 of the uh, veterans that you are talking about earlier Secretary of State, and on behalf of the uh, campaigning body uh, who have been working very hard for the last year to try and get relief for the uh, 8,500 Commonwealth veterans across the Commonwealth who for years uh, have lived and lingered on a hardly meal a day, and the United Kingdom has been in default of the military covenant, which effectively says that anyone who served the Crown uh, does actually deserve a duty of care from this country. We've been in default. Uh, you have brought it out of default to often criticise the things you don't do. Could I, on behalf of all those people, thank you very much indeed for what you have done. Sincerely, most grateful to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, an Australian student at LSE and uh, also putting in time with the Liberal Democrats downstairs. Um, so I wanted to take a step back and say soft power is quite a slippery concept. This has been very government focused um, and military focused necessarily, but what are the things that are slipping through by that? Civil society has to be, you mentioned it in the last um, response, civil society generates and expends soft power. So where, where does that interact and what is government possibly crowding out by being the, um, the driving force behind it? So, so just on, uh, on the First point, well, thank you very much for, for saying that, but I should say thank you back to you. I mean, one of the, this has been a great piece of work that we have done in the department, and we have looked at uh, where these veterans are and the organizations in country that are supporting them. And it is amazing, there's a network of volunteers, some people where there's, uh, there's no social protection schemes in place are literally cycling uh, money and support. Uh, two people each week. Um, it's an amazing, um, it's an amazing example of civil society, um, and that is exactly what we should be doing. Uh, we don't need very expensive programs to do a lot of these things. We need uh, to have a really good understanding of how to deliver things on the ground. We need to work with local people to do that. And uh, this program will be fantastic, and it will be amazing value for money because of organisations like you. And it's a privilege to deliver this program with you and thank you for 
for your input to, to date on that. Um, we do, a lot of what DFID does is supporting civil society. The two things you need to get really right to have an effect in a particular place is local political buy-in and you need great civil society. And when people think of civil society, they think of advocacy groups and those sorts of things. But in places that it's much more tangible than that. A great example of this is Ukraine with the, uh, the reforms that are going on there. Those are civil servants who are volunteers that have delivered uh, those things. So wherever we go, we want to support um, civil society. And um, we need to, as I say, work uh, to ensure that we are, we're not uh, replicating things, we're not getting in the way of things. Um, the development world has moved a long, long way from where it used to be on that sort of thing through things like the grand uh, bargain. Um, and I think DFID is seen as a world leader in that. This is not me blowing my own trumpet. I just, uh, you know, head the organization up. Very, very clever um, and sophisticated ways of uh, delivering help to people in a sustainable way and growing that capacity and also supporting the advocacy that we, we need to see on the other agenda about rights um, and freedoms as well. Because without that, uh, we won't hold the other stuff uh, uh, when we achieve it. So that's what we should do. Final point, John. Yeah, just on, on, the, on the soft power thing. I mean, my, my thanks, Chris. My view is, as I said earlier on, if, if, if we can get what the Secretary of State is talking about, add in things like education properly, add in alternative livelihoods, get in economic advisors who are practical people, the bankers, etc., etc. One can convert this amalgam between hard power and soft power, to use two cliches, into smart power. But we've got to become truly comprehensive. I think, again, picking up on Secretary of State's point just now about civil society, and the point I also make, I think so much of this comes under that very broad banner. I mean, like the rule of law, but to do it, but not to try to impose some, for them, alien way of doing it, but to find out how the principles behind how we do things like rule of law, say, in this country, can be, can be applied in a, to, to produce a, a simple, timely solution for them in order to try to undercut what the bad guys are very insidiously and cleverly doing behind the scenes, which create a dependency on the local, uh, for the local population. To begin to do all that, it then becomes not just soft power, but smart power. Thanks. Thank you. All remains for me is to call upon our Chair of Clotise, Alexander Downer, to deliver a brief vote of thanks, and we'll end on time for the first time ever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I want, um, on behalf of everybody here, to thank uh, the Secretary of State and uh, Brigadier Deverell for their contribution. As um, a Commonwealth citizen myself, um, I must say I thought it was, had a great touch of humanity and decency that the Secretary of State was announcing the support for Commonwealth veterans. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I, I'm entirely... I'm not the High Commissioner anymore. I can say what I think. I'm, entirely the former Member of Parliament who congratulated the Secretary of State. It sounds like a small thing, but it's a very moral thing to do for people who fought for this country. They shouldn't be left uh, in need. Um, the second thing I'd um, like to say as a former aide and foreign minister myself, the two roles in Australia were and still are combined. Um, I can tell you from whether that's a good or a bad thing, I'll leave the rest of you to think about it. But, um, but the one observation I would make was that through all of the years I did that job, um, there was an umbilical relationship between the Australian Defence Force and um, AusAid, as it was then called, our aid agency. Um, there is a huge role for defence in supporting the objectives of foreign aid. Um, and you find it in peacekeeping, for example, as we found in Bougainville and the Solomon Islands and places like that, um, you find it um, particularly in the area of disaster relief. So however you link up the Defence Force and, and the aid agency, um, I'm not sure about joining them entirely together by the way, I'm not sure that would work, but however <laughs> you join them up, um, there inevitably is going to be that umbilical relationship. Um, um, perhaps that's the wrong metaphor because never to be broken, I was going to say, that much probably not the right metaphor, but um, in any case, that is a hugely important relationship. So I'd like to thank also uh, Brigadier Deverell for his contri contribution as well. And from all his experience, I think you'd all agree, um, it kind of reinforced the point that I'm making. So to both of you, thank you very much. Thank you.